Hey everybody, it's Captain Kyle. I'm here with author Greg Cox. He's written an amazing number of books, a lot of movie adaptations such as uh, Man of Steel, Dark Knight Rises, Godzilla, Ghost Rider, more, plus a number of Star Trek books, Farscape, X-Files, and a lot more of the franchise-based novels. So how are you doing today? Oh, good. I, I am glad to be back at a convention. This is my first convention in two and a half years. I have been going through serious con withdrawal the last two years, so it is great to be finally out and like talking to fans and mingling again. So I, I have been, like I said, I've been, I've been waiting for this, and I've been talking to the nice folks at Zenkai Con now about this for three years now, it seems like. It's great to be finally here. Awesome. So I'm going to mix up the order of my que questions. At cons, you meet a lot of fans. Mm -hmm. um, is there a fan experience that has really stood out to you? Ooh, putting me on the spot here. Um, my brain is suddenly going blank. But, you know, it, it, it is great just to actually, you know, as a writer, you're sitting alone writing stuff in your, you know, off in your, you know, your attic or whatever, or, you know, Starbucks. It's nice to finally get some feedback. Nothing is more frustrating than to put a book out there and just kind of like it drops and you never hear from it again. And I've had a few of those. But, you know, so nothing. What is cool is like I, I do get fan mail and think when people tell me that a book got them through a rough time, that I was having a rough summer, that your Superman book got me through, or gee, I read this book while my mom was in the hospital. I mean, you know, and I, I simply, I've been there. I, I remember, you know, rough times or, or also just someone told me I had a great summer vacation. And I read your book at summer camp and it was, you know, I read your whole series and this was great. So, you know, have, you know, we are, you know, I was a reader, I still am a reader, so knowing that I've given other people that experience of either, you know, making their weekend at summer camp better, they read, they, they sat in a hammock and read my book, or that long weekend when they were sitting, you know, in a waiting room waiting to find out if mom and dad were okay, or their dog was going to recover, you know, it's good to be part of that. Plus, it's also great just to be part of the grand tradition of these franchises, well, that you're part of a be a Planet of the Apes or Star Trek that, you know, something I grew up reading and loving and now I get to contribute to it. And there's younger people. Now, I'll admit to having a slightly mixed feeling. There's a double-edged sword. Come, come, come. This is a fanish experience I get more and more often these days. Oh, I love your stuff. Well, I loved your stuff when I was a little kid. <laughs> and I appreciate the sentiment and I take that in the spirit in which it intended is, oh, I loved your books when I was a kid. Oh, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> How long has it been? Okay, you know. Definitely, yeah, can, can make you feel a little old, but I, I didn't. In a good way. I didn't love your stuff when I was a kid. I, I was more of an adult when you started putting them out. So, speaking of that, how did you break into um, working on so many different movie adaptations and you know with these franchises? Honestly, I started out on the other side of the desk. Uh, for years, I was a full-time editor working nine to five at Tor Books, which is one of the major science fiction and fantasy. Um, publishers. In fact, I'm still a consulting editor for Tor. Um, and I actually started out editing tie-in novels for Tor, editing movie novelizations. And it's a small world. You start getting connections and the media franchise people get to know you and the other editors who specialize in media stuff get to you and say, Greg, you, you're, you're into Batman, aren't you? You know, we, we, we need a Batman story by Thursday. You think you can get us a Batman story for this anthology? Or, you know, Greg, you're into Star Trek, right? We really need a Deep Space Nine novel by June. And, you know, and I kind of gradually segged from being a full-time editor who wrote media tie-in novels on the side to being a full-time media tie-in writer who still does a little editing on the side and still does some media tie-in editing on the side. So I, I have a foot in both camps there, but that was sort of, I started out on the other side of the desk. I editing Mortal Kombat books and Freddy Krueger books. God help me, I edited the novelization of Cutthroat Island, one of the biggest box office bombs in Hollywood history, uh, which, I'm, which I'm perversely proud of. Okay. Um, and then so just sort of gradually, because it is a small world and we all, all the, we know each other and we know each other's tastes and, you know. And it was like, you know, hey, Greg, you, you, you like vampires. We just bought the rights to this vampire series, Underworld, or, you know, what's your schedule like? So, fine, you know. That's awesome. That's definitely not a way that everyone can get into that particular, you know, side of the business. I don't, you know, people always ask me how you get into the, you know, 
Star Trek writing business or the movie novel. I'm not sure there is a preferred track. I don't think anybody ever went to college and majored in movie novelization writing. Mm -hmm. I think we all kind of wandered into it through from different channels. But usually, you're, usually you start out in publishing somehow. You you you're, you're writing your own stuff, and then you know you let it be known that you're kind of interested in Stargate and the Stargate, editor. or you 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 you're, you're 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 an editor or you're you know. You're involved in stuff, or maybe you're on the show, you wrote for the shows, and then you start writing for the books. I think most of us are all involved in publishing in some capacity already. We've we're selling stories to Asimov. We were, you know, working, you know, proof as copy editors or something, and it's just being in the right place at the right time, you know. And then, as with any career, the hard part is getting your foot in the door. Then one job, oh, you did Daredevil. Well, why don't you do Ghost Rider? Oh, you did Ghost Rider. Why don't you do, you know, Batman? So. And eventually, if you're lucky, you become one of the usual suspects, you know. Absolutely. And Asimov's, I've been rejected by them, so. <laughs> so. I did some Asimov's. I sold to Amazing Stories, um, et cetera. I, I just sold a story um, to the official Star Trek magazine that's going to come out in June. I, in fact, I was told I could announce that this weekend, that, yeah, I, I sold a Star Trek story to the official Star Trek magazine. It now publishes fiction, so that's cool. Very nice. Now, how does it feel writing, you know, original stuff compared to playing in someone else's sandbox, basically all these, you know, universes? Well, the, my, the embarrassing guilty secret I have is actually for the last several years, I haven't written all that much original stuff. I, you know, um, and this is a very good problem to have because the, um, you know, tie-in writer, tie-in writing keeps me busy. But yeah, I barely, so tell me about your original novels. My what? Yeah, you know, and my New York, my New Year's resolution every year often is this is the year I'm going to write an original novel, and then someone calls me up and say, Hey, Greg, you know, you want to write Godzilla? Hell yes, and, and not only because hey, I'm a you know fanboy, and yes, of course I'm going to write Godzilla, but also hey, the roof needs repair, I need some dental work, and oh, fine, that, 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 like I said, this is a good problem to have. I will say that during the pandemic, things slowed down a little bit, so I actually did write an original novel, and my agent is out flogging it now, which is a whole new experience for me. So that's really the whole sort of like submitting things around and getting rejection slips. I've been, I've been spoiled in terms of just, sorry, hey, Greg, we, we're, you know, we need a CSI novel. What's your schedule like? You know, so. Yeah, well, definitely from what I understand, a Star Trek novel, you're kind of guaranteed a certain amount of sales, whereas an original novel, people have to decide to kind of take it. So... I can definitely see where it can be lucrative. And also the thing that's actually kind of um, I've been spoiled by is you generally, um, you sell it on the basis of it. Usually I start out, regardless if it's Star Trek or whatever, it's kind of a 12-page outline or something, and then it gets approved by Paramount, and then they pay you money. And so there's none of this writing a whole long book on spec. And I'm, I'm spoiled here in that a lot of authors, you know, oh, I'll write a novel and hope it sells. I, I write a 12-page Star Trek episode, you know, outline, and if... And sometimes, yeah, Paramount will say, no, we don't want to do this. They'll veto it. But what else you got? And I come up with something else. I get, you know, it gets, the book is signed up before I write it. And if it's a movie novelization, even better. You know, here's the script. Turn it in. You know, you have 45 days. Turn it into a uh, book. Again, there's none of this. I'm going to write a book on spec. I hope, it's, hope to God it sells and I can find a home. You know, so good. You know. That does sound awesome. Now, you mentioned... With the movie adaptations, they give you a script, and usually it's not necessarily the final script. Not at all. Have you seen situations where you wrote something based on an earlier script, and then the movie, you saw the movie, and you're like, that is totally new to me? Absolutely. In fact, um, I'm actually doing a panel on how to write movie novelizations today at 6 p.m. at this convention. But yeah, no, the, the thing that often shocks people is, no, I don't see the movie. I have been editing and you know, writing movie novelizations for decades now. And no, I, I see the movie when it opens at the local multiplex the same day as everybody else. And I am invariably working from an early version of the script and whatever production art I can pry out of the studio. And sometimes, and then things get changed. And, you know, you know I know it's always, I remember the first, I'm always like, oh, so that's what that looks like. Oh, no one told me that character was a woman. Oh, you know, you know. Oh, they moved that around. And now, sometimes, 
um, they will alert you. I've, I've gotten the last minute phone call of, hi, Greg, they've shot a new ending. We're faxing you the, you know, new script pages, you know, how soon can you get us the revised last chapter? Oh my God, oh my God. But no, invariably, no novelization is ever going to be exactly, because, you know, ad-libs on the set, or scenes get cut out, or scenes get added. Um, and that's just part of the process. So that's, I understand that's part of the appeal of reading the novelizations, because you get the deleted scenes. I do remember one scene time, there was a, or one of the under, I did the novelization of some of the Underworld movies, the Vampire versus Lycans movies. Mm -hmm. And there was a scene that was in the original script, and I got a note from the studio saying, hi, Greg, we've cut this scene out of the movie. Could you please cut it out of the book? And I appealed the decision, partly because, you know, part of the challenge is taking like a 120-page script and turning it into a 300-page novel. I, you got to flesh things out. And also I thought, okay, this scene doesn't actually contradict anything. It actually kind of gets the point from point A to K B. It's kind of a nice scene. I, can, I, can I please keep this scene? And they actually went to the I don't usually you know, argue this stuff, but they went to the director and they asked him, Greg would like to keep this scene in the book. He said, oh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to add that to the director's cut when we put it out on DVD so you can keep that scene in. But, but yeah, no, it, it, there's, always, there's always a surprise and like, oh, my God, I didn't realize. And this came as a surprise. The very first movie... I ever novelized was Daredevil, the Batman Affleck film. And I was young and stupid. And I, I, that, that one, I, I remember going in the theater and just being, oh, wow, because things moved. And actually, the movie, the, the script I had and the, movie, the theatrical version were very different. Scenes were all moved around. Entire subplots and characters were missing from the theatrical version, which were in the book. And thank God they let me keep those in the book, because it would have been a very skinny book otherwise. But yeah, that was my first experience. Was, oh, wow, wow, they cut things, you know. Well, I mean, obviously, in the editing process, there's, there's a lot of things that move around. Now, I do want to talk about the franchise books, and actually Star Trek in particular, which I see you have some, some Star Trek awesome stuff. Um, I'm going to have to uh, check those out, because I'm always looking for TOS. I, I like all the series, but um, with, the, with the TNG books, or, well, with all the Star Trek books, a lot of times I know that their rule was it's status quo at the beginning of the book it has to be status quo at the end of the book you can kill every single character but they have to be alive at the end of the book so but then with next generation they kind of allowed people to like expand on that they had titan they had picard mary um beverly crusher and they had a child and everything and then they came out with picard and basically do you feel that that kind of did a uh, Disney ex expanded universe thing to some of the uh, novels? I, well, you know, th th this is just honestly an occupational hazard. Um, you know, continuity flows downhill from the actual TV shows and movies when you're doing the franchise stuff. Uh, you know, and, you know, the vast majority of the audience knows the TV movie version, so you have to stay, con you know, it's just, this is not a Star Trek thing. This is every single tie-in franchise I've ever worked on. You know, no, the books have to be consistent with the, um, the screen versions. The screen versions do not have to be consistent with the books, and it's unrealistic, honestly. I'm pragmatic about this. To expect, you know, the books to worry, to expect a $200 million movie to worry about what happened in a seven ninety nine paperback published 25 years ago. <laughs> and in the case of Star Trek, where there's something like probably 850 novels at this point, you know, no, this is, this is you know, you, 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 you always run the risk of your book being rendered apocryphal by a later movie or TV show. Uh, and this has happened to me many times. It will happen to me many times again, you know. And again, these are, you know, these are not characters you invented or anything. Um, uh, I remember, you know, on Khan, it's like they... You know, it's like, oh, you know, I did not invent Khan. I, I wrote three novels about Khan, Nuni, and Singh, and they are actually well-regarded in some of my most popular books. But, you know, I didn't invent Khan. I was seven years old when Khan was invented. So I don't expect that I was the first person to write about Khan. I will not be the last person to write about Khan. And, they are, and future people will do different things with Khan, and they are not obliged to follow my book, and nor should they. So, I, I, like I said, I'm pragmatic about it. And, and honestly, growing up, I, I'm sort of used to the idea... I'm going to be showing my inner curmudgeon here. That nowadays, there's this expectation that everything has to be one big seamless continuity and much concern about canon. When I was growing up, you know, okay, there was Tarzan, and there was the old Johnny Weissmiller movies, and there was the new color movies, you know, 
at the drive-in, and there was the Ronnie Eli TV show, and there was the Saturday morning cartoon, and there was the Gold Key comics, and they were not 100% consistent with each other, but they were all Tarzan, and you just kind of expected that, you know, ditto the Dark Shadows novels versus the Dark Shadows TV show versus the movies versus the comic strip versus, you know, the Gold Key comics. The idea that, there, the, that none of this stuff is set in stone. I mean, I, I, I joke, I grew up on DC Comics. I'm used to the continuity being reset every five years, you know. <laughs> what, is, what is Catwoman's origin this week? You know, this is just, you know, part of, this is part of the fun and the charm of, you know, any long running process. And it is funny when it happens to you. I actually, it's funny, I actually, one of my Underworld novels, I did an novelization of the third Underworld movie, which actually utterly contradicted the plot of one of my earlier original Underworld novels. And I remember my agent, sorry, my editor calling me up, and I think he was more nervous about this than I was. And Greg, I just got in the script for, for movie three, and um, it, it kind of renders your entire second novel completely, and he was kind of nervous. I, I go, you know, Ed, if you're asking me whether I'd be uncomfortable writing a book that completely contradicts my previous book, you know, how much are you offering and when do you need it by? <laughs> Although it was funny, I remember there were some comments on Amazon, you know, Greg Cox, make up your mind, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Well, well, money. Occupational hazard. Right, and money definitely can, you know, ease those, those pains. And you can always say, it's a multiverse. <laughs> I like to think the books are still fun. I, I, I think, you know, you know, the world is full of wonderful Star Trek novels that have been rendered apocryphal by later movies. They're still fun books. They're still enjoyable. They are just variants on a theme, you know. And every so often, I will note, every so often, once in a while, things from the books in Star Trek do occasionally seep upstairs into the actual shows. Uh, Sulu's first name Hikaru came from a novel by Vonda McIntyre. Yura's first name, Nyota, came from a book, I believe, by William Rotzler. And I actually, y'all can brag, I'm going to dine out on this forever. They finally give the character of number one, played by Majel Barrett, mm -hmm. they've finally given her a name, Una. And that actually comes from a Star Trek trilogy that was written by me and some of my associates. So, yes, that's my Hikaru Sulu moment, and I'm going to brag about that for the rest of my natural life. <laughs> I don't blame you. You mentioned the con novels, which I quite enjoyed. And since the original con episode was, you know, in the 60s, and they figured by 1999, we'd have spaceships and all this stuff. Um, how did you come up with the idea of making it more of a, a secret war with the with the enhanced human? Well, like I said, you know, like I said, according to Star Trek lore, you know, the eugenics wars took place in the 1990s. Those of us who lived through the 1990s do not probably remember Khan taking over a quarter of the world, you know. I joke that Bill Clinton does not get enough credit for the way he dealt with, you know, the, you know, <gasps> eugenics wars. But, you know, I think that was just something that sort of, you know, I, my editor, John Ordover, and I came up together. There were, there were two ways we could go there, and both of them were perfectly valid options. We could just throw real history out the window and just do this complete weird alternate history where there was this huge apocalyptic war in the 1990s. Or we could try to, and this seemed more fun, to kind of shoehorn um, the Eugenics Wars into the 1990s as we knew it, of the idea that it was only, there were all these weird brush fire wars and strange events and conspiracies, and it was only in hindsight that the historians of Kate, you know, Kirk's era realized that these were united by a secret, you know, clandestine war between genetically engineered superhumans. And that was the approach we took in those books, which was, which, you know, there, there, there was another author out there who probably could have wrote in a wonderful techno thriller, Ted Clan, Tom Clancy-esque eugenics wars, you know, blockbuster adventure thing. Or we could do the X-Files approach, and that's what I did, which seemed like more fun at the time. Oh, definitely a fun series. So any projects coming out that you can actually share with us? There's not a lot I could talk about, although um, I said I've got a new Star Trek story. It's a Voyager story, actually, um, in the June issue of Star Trek Explorer magazine. And just for fun, I have had, there's a small press book coming out in April called Running Home to Shadows, which is a collection of nostalgic essays about watching Dark Shadows as a kid. And that was another one of my obsessions as a kid. So, yeah, of course, they invited me, Greg, do you want to write an essay about being a Dark Shadows kid back in the 60s? And I said, yes. And that book is, I believe, coming out in April. It's called Running Home to Shadows because we all had to run home from school to watch Dark Shadows at 4 p.m. on, you know, ABC, you know. And they found an awful lot of actually professional writers who were all willing to sort of, oh, God, remember 
you know, making their Barnabas models and playing their Barnabas games and rushing home to watch Barnabas and Angelique. And that's coming out in April. Well, that's awesome. So keep an eye out for those. Anything you want to say to your fans before we wrap up? Oh, just uh, uh, thank you for supporting my books all these years. If you haven't read them, check them out. And I am determined to leave no franchise untouched by my grubby little hands. So hopefully, you know, you know, Godzilla, I don't know if you're into Planet of the Apes, Star Wars, Marvel, DC. Chances are there's a Greg Cox book for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all the yes, all the franchises. Well, thank you so much, Greg. Yeah, good. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Um, definitely check out his books. And as always, have fun and follow your fandom. Thank you for watching this video. I am Invader Zim, and I traffic in doom. And so, if you do not subscribe to this channel, you will have doom that befalls you by me, Invader Zim.